Let me ask you this question to begin our study of the evening. Uh, are you a biblical genius? Or I could put it another way. Are you a spiritual genius? I have a little book in my library written by Will Durant. For those who have any interest in history, then you'll know of his great work of world history. But he has one on lessons of history. And he gives the definition of genius. He says, and I quote, it is a combination of clarity of mind and energy of will, unquote. I think many times that the will is much more even involved in the matter than clarity of mind. One doesn't rule out the other, but it certainly means you can have a very clear, logical mind and a high IQ, but if you don't have the will to use it properly, it won't do you any good. So there must still be the will to act, the will to do what's necessary to learn. And our Lord, of course, made that clear, as did both the in the Old Testament as well, concerning exercising the will. Joshua said, choose you this day. Well, I don't care how high the IQ of the people were, they still had the will to choose the right way and so on. Now to Christians, we find this emphasized. Second Corinthians 10 and verse five tells Christians to bring every thought into captivity before the Lord and to never be weary in doing that which is proper, Galatians 6, 9. Well, that takes will, a determination. And I like, as one preacher said one time, being stubborn with the truth. So without these things, no one can fulfill really being a spiritual genius or any other kind. What are we saying? We're saying that a faithful child of God is going to be one who knows the book, who understands it, who applies it, who never gives up. There was a cynic that I read of who once remarked, and I'm quoting, you must not enthrone ignorance just because there's so much of it, unquote. So how do we look at these things? Well, I think, first of all, we realize there's a great need to admonish the Lord's church today and warn them against mediocrity. God never wanted mediocre Christians. There are so few men like Joshua, like a Barnabas, like a Daniel, with absolute dedication, faithfulness, loyalty, and fervency of spirit to do the Lord's will. Sometimes we even applaud the schemes and dreams of lazy people instead of deeply appreciating those like, well, for example, I think Andrew. You don't read a lot about Andrew in the scriptures. I, when I think of Andrew, what little there is said about him in the scriptures, I think of one quietly but effectively going about doing what he's capable of doing, that he's willing not to receive the limelight of the chief seats or the applause, he just does what's right because it's right. And he loves God and he keeps God's commandments no matter who takes note of him. I think uh, of a good anecdote here. You know, we used to read about, especially in the days of feudal Europe, of the village idiot. And this village idiot delighted the crowds on a Saturday for many, many years by choosing a nickel that was offered to him over 
a dime. And the people would laugh at him and scoff at him and his ignorance. But later on, many years later, a person asked him about his choice. Why, why did you choose a nickel over a dime? Don't you know the dime's worth much more than the nickel? His uh, quiet, succinct remark in answer to that question was, well, if, if I took the dime, they would have quit playing with me, which means I wouldn't have got a nickel. And of course, he was collecting many nickels. So all of a sudden, he wasn't the village idiot or clown anymore, but those who laughed at him and kept giving him nickels turned out to be the clown. I think there's a scene in 1 Samuel chapter 17 where the tables turn rather rapidly. You remember a giant man, some 10 feet tall, mocks the armies of Israel and makes mockery of a lovely young shepherd boy. But powerful words of what we would simply say is an in-depth sublime faith and devotion come from the lips of that shepherd boy and later king of Israel, David. And here's what he said. I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, whom thou hast defied, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then he said, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now, question. Who was the apparent genius on that very important occasion that inspiration is recorded for us to read today about what it means to be an obedient, faithful servant of God? I mentioned some time ago about an Austrian um, psych, uh, psychiatrist, a psychoanalyst, in fact, that he spent many torturous years in a German prison camp. And later he became, the, as I said, a, a great, and in fact, a leader among the, the psychotherapy people. And uh, he often quoted the following words. And I quote, he who has a why to live can bear with almost any how, unquote. And probably the best example of that from God's good word is Job himself. Job, of course, is one of the heroes of the Old Testament. This great man of God learned that lesson that is uttered by Frankel many centuries ago. I would say he's a spiritual genius. Now, a good commentary on the book of Job is Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. And from that verse, we learn that victory comes from the power of God and not from the boastful pride of finite, mere humans. I think there is joy unsurpassed in helping the heavenly plan, even if one doesn't know all there is to know or is as capable as a lot of the people are, but simply because of intense dedication and doing the best they can with what they know and in the way they can carry out the truth of God in their lives. Have you ever given any thought when you read about Paul escaping his persecutors by being let down in a basket over the wall? What do I mean by the question, have you ever given any thought to it? Well, I simply mean, who were the men that held the rope that let him down? 
Well, you know, they were just as important in that whole thing as Paul was. But many times when we're called on to hold, hold the rope and let somebody down in the basket, as it were, then we don't think we're doing very much. But I suggest those people who got the basket ready, let him down over the wall, helped him get away, was very important people when it came to the spreading of the gospel of Christ and aiding Paul in his great work. And I'm sure they did it with understanding that they would receive a great deal of praise. In fact, their name's not even mentioned. And yet somebody had to do it and they were willing to do it. It's important to realize these things if we're going to be able to be what God expects us to be. When I think about giving God the glory, that's only done by our obedience to the truth. We can say we give God the glory, but if we're not keeping his will, we're, we're not giving him any glory at all. And when you think about the widow, who quietly, but very generously, gave all she had, though the amount wasn't very much as far as money that day was concerned, Mark 12, 41 through 44, it was a great deal. And remember, the scripture records the Lord setting over against the treasury watching what they put in. And he selected her as the example to go into the scriptures to teach us. And likely every one of us have far more of this world's goods than she ever did. So out of deep poverty, we learn that the brethren of Macedonia begged to be allowed to contribute what Paul thought was more than they were able to give. To give. And he says the way, the way they were able to do that was because they first gave themselves. Well, there's nobody going to accomplish anything in service to God or really much of anything else unless they, their heart's in it and unless they put all they have into it. And when you give yourself to it, what have you got goes with it? So really, some are spiritually dumb, if lack of a better way to put it. And some belong to the category of spiritual geniuses. And who are they? They are those who are steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as they know their labor is not in vain in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So there is a dramatic contrast between the futility of what we know as humanism that says man's the measure of all things and the very rich and everlasting rewards that emanate from great obedient trust in God. And we can read that from Genesis through the book of Revelation. You remember that Judas Iscariot sold himself, if you please, for 30 pieces of silver. But you say, no, he, he sold the Lord. Well, in reality, he sold himself. Pilate also released the wrong man. Herod allowed lust to cloud his decisions, Matthew 14. And then there's always the rich young ruler who put a high premium on the fleeting values of the mundane affairs of this world and the matters of this world, Mark 10. And then when Paul is preaching to Felix, Felix was convicted of sin, but he wouldn't give it up. He remained in its grip. Back to the Old Testament and King Ahab, he bartered his soul when he married into wickedness by marrying Jezebel. And in 1 Samuel 15, 24, King Saul, who had such a promising beginning, ended up saying that he feared the people and he obeyed their voice rather than obey God. Well, do we think those are the only times those things have happened and the only people that ever did such things? No, those are all written to teach us that if we would serve God faithfully today, then we must turn away from such things. That to be faithful to God today and obedient to him 
is to be really quite a genius. Remember the definition earlier? Genius is a combination of clarity of mind and energy of will. Yes, our mind needs to be clear and be sure we're doing what God said in the way he said it and for the reason, or if there's more than one reason, that he said do it. Why is that? Because Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. How do I know I've kept any commandment of God? I just gave the formula. Be sure it's what God said do in the way God said do it. And for the reason, if there's more than one reason that God said do it. And you, you can know you completely obeyed whatever commandment God has given you. And after all, God has made it very clear through the wise man inspired of the Holy Spirit that the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and keep his commandments. Well, this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it is evil. So we can be spiritual giants. And I end here. If we want to. So we thank you for listening and hope this has been official to you.